So, Richard, I guess it's almost time. And as usual, we have lots to discuss today. For our top news, richest nations have agreed to end support for coal production overseas. And the question, might this be the end of coal? In technology, 3Ds, printings, new challenge, can it solve the U.S. housing shortage? Now, materials. Here's a material story that is not about graphene. It's about a new type of atomically thin carbon material, but we don't know as yet what it will do. In space and astronomy, the question for Mars is, could swarms of robots be what we need to dig underground cities on Mars? In the environment, we have a problem. The world may breach the 1.5 centigrade, centigrade read, uh, warming within five years. In biology, a bioengineer aims to turn peptides, nature's virus fighters, into powerful drugs. But apparently, years of development and testing remain. For us people, question, is it time for a world without gender? Will we treat people based on who they are rather than on the form of their genitals? And in health, another AI result. AI enabled EKGs find that the difference between numerical age and biological age significantly affects health. So that's what we'll talk about. And now, Richard, what's this in the top story about richest nations agreeing to end support for coal production overseas? Now, this, I think, is uh, the beginning of the end for... Uh, fossil fuels of all kind. Uh, in the last uh, week or so, the world's richest nations, specifically the G7, uh, have agreed to end their financial support for coal development overseas. This is a major step towards phasing out uh, the dirtiest of the fossil fuels. And so they're committed to phasing out coal and fully decarbonizing their energy sections in the 2030s. Now, uh, it turns out on the G7 are Japan and China, and those are two of the three uh, company countries that actually do the most of the financing for coal plants overseas and they <coughs> kind of struck being dragged into it agreed to this uh, and they signed up to the third uh, big country financing overseas coal development is South Korea they're not a part of the G7, but they agreed to it as well. And, uh, you know, they, to agree to it, they had to end up in uh, what for them is big business financing coal-fired power plants all over the world. And we're glad that they're ending that business. It turns out, even though we've had the pandemic this year, uh, there's been an increase this year in the use of coal and uh, the increase that they expect to see will be the second biggest rise in emissions on record because uh, they're using more coal and it's particularly, of course, China doing using more coal. But this agreement gives a very strong signal to the world 
that coal is the energy of the past and has no place in our future energy mix. And it sets the stage for a radical transition towards clean energy. Now, the, as I said, China is still the biggest problem in the world. They're putting out the most pollution every year. And uh, China, of all the G7 countries, is still has yet to produce a national plan to end their greenhouse emissions by 2030. They do have a plan to get to net zero by 2060, but that is uh, too late. And anyway, so I think that uh, this is a big announcement and uh, it's going to mean no new coal starting now and phasing out coal in countries in the 2030s. So it's clearly uh, something that is going in the right way for humanity. Any thoughts? It's sad to see China being obstructive because the other thing that they're doing which i think is the wrong direction is um they're allowing people they're encouraging people to have three children you, you know so uh that's going in the wrong direction as well yes no, well. Actually, uh, i i read that even when they encouraged from one to two it didn't make any difference and they don't think that going from one, two to three is going to make much difference. Because mm -hmm. the problem that China has is people are living cities and it's expensive to raise children. And uh, when both members of the family are working, then it's very hard to raise children, just like it is in America and Canada and in the West. There, there was a New York Times article that all about uh, populations in the future. And they projected that China's population would drop from 1.5 billion to 700 million in the next 50 years. Wow. Which is uh, shocking. Wow. Uh, yeah. And they, 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 it was the whole article was about these massive population shifts and drops so that, you know, people are going to be 90 and 100 years old and there's going to be no young people to replace them and this tectonic shift in drop in population shift in age was going to have major and potentially catastrophic repercussions on on world the world economy in general and when i was in india they were saying by about 2030 uh that they expected india's population to be bigger than china's and india has a lot more young people than china and so they're saying uh you know the middle of this century will be india's time in the world i have a, just a quick question richard or anybody uh nuclear power hasn't come up in in these meetings much but do you have a sense that uh, it, it gets a bad rap and it probably is, would be a real good place for nuclear, but for the bad rap that it has? Do you have any sense of, it does not happen in this country, I don't think, but in other countries, is, is nuclear making a comeback? Uh, there is nuclear now that is a lot cleaner and it, there are installations that are happening in the other parts of the world. Uh, I think what the really looking for is uh, fusion power. And by 2025, the test that is presently going on uh, looks like there's a very good chance that uh, they will show the actual feasibility for fusion power with technology that we have now. And my instinct says by the time you're at 2050 or something like that, you'll be hearing a lot about fusion power and won't be hearing so much about nuclear. And Richard, just on that question, uh, I too am impressed with the idea of fusion. In terms of the fission stuff, some articles I've read, and I have no idea whether they're accurate or not, 
say that when you take into account all the stuff you have to do to get a, a, a nuclear plant up and what you have to do afterwards in terms of decommissioning it and so on, there's no net energy from it. Right. Have you ever seen that? Uh, because if that's the case, is it in any sense a positive thing? I think I've heard the same argument, and uh, I don't know what the facts are. It wouldn't surprise me because still the, since we still don't have a good method of disposing of the waste, then uh, it's hard to know what the real costs are yet. We want to move on to technology. The question is, can we solve the U.S. housing shortage with 3D printing? What's that about? Uh, 3D printing is another thing that is interesting to me because I think it's uh, it has become a way of the future. And now there is a new generation of startups that wants to disrupt the way that houses are built by automating production using industrial 3D printing. And there are just a small number of startups around the world, but they are applying 3D printing to house construction. And they say it's faster, cheaper, and more sustainable. And uh, they think in the US that 3D printing can help address the severe housing shortage that has led to soaring house prices, overcrowding, evictions, and homelessness. Now, in the US, the two biggest companies together have built less than 100 houses, so it's not very big yet. And uh, they're trying to get bigger. One of them plans to build a thousand houses this year, and uh, the different houses, uh, one of them is called Icon, and he says 3D printing system can do the work of 10 to 20 workers in five or six different trades, and unlike humans, the machines can work 24 hours a day, and the process can eliminate nearly all production waste and save two to three tons of carbon per building unit. And so of the two different companies, one is a company Mighty Buildings who has a factory in Oakland, California. And now they are presently building just 350 square foot uh, accessory dwellings that you can combine a couple of them and make a 700 square foot building. Uh, they say their construction costs are 40% lower than uh, others in California. And what they do is they build the whole thing up in their factory and then ship the different pieces to the site that means they're limited by what they can put on a truck and what they can get through tunnels and overpasses. Uh, as I say, they're planning on building a thousand houses next year, so they're scaling up. Uh, they were also apparently behind the deal that was that is going on in Rancho Mirage in California where they are offering a, a small development with 15 lots that has a 1,450 square foot primary home, a 700 square foot casita, a swimming pool. Uh, the whole thing is solar powered and the houses sell for $850,000. In California, these were snapped up very quickly after they became available, and they now have a waiting list of 500 home builders. Uh, one of the things that uh, Mighty Buildings is doing also is they are opening up their software so that uh, architects can design custom buildings using their software so they're really trying to open up the market 
Yeah, now uh, Texas company Icon I C O N uses 3D printing technology, and they're the ones who has done uh, a development for poor families in uh, Nicaragua, and they do it differently. Instead of producing the buildings in factory, they bring their Vulcan printer to work on site and it squeezes out long tubes of concrete layer by layer and dries quickly and forms the walls of a house. Uh, they do it this way to eliminate the shipping costs and give themselves more design freedom since they don't have to worry about the tunnels. And they say their construction costs are 30% cheaper and they can build houses twice as fast. So these 3D printed houses aren't much of a thing in the U.S. now, but uh, wait a few years and I think it's going to be uh, the future of them. One of the other benefits for the construction industry is since the housing crash in Obama's day, then the construction industry, uh, the workforce has really been decimated. There wasn't work. People changed their professions. Uh, and the now that the housing boom has resumed, the construction companies can't find enough, enough workers. And certainly having 3D printing, eliminating the read, the need for 20 workers for each printer that you install helps the manpower issues as well. So maybe this is the future. Oh, here, let me show you something. I'm sorry. Here we have, this is the Oakland company when they are printing their walls and you can see they print uh, a top and a bottom and an internal uh, reinforcing section and they fill them with foam so they're well insulated. Uh, this is what a completed module looks like ready for shipping. This is a module that they're dropping into place and here's a uh, a 3D house that's made from that. This is a small house, but it looks quite nice. So anyway, so that's 3D houses for you. Who wants to buy a 3D house? Just one comment on CBS Sunday more. Can yes. Can you hear me? Yes. Can you hear me? Yes. Uh, on CBS Sunday morning, uh, they, demonst they demonstrated uh, one of these, basically it was a big hose that was squirting out a cylinder of cement. Uh, and it was on site, just this giant printer, uh, which was demonstrating. And you probably go to CBS Sunday morning and see what it looks like. It's different than what you were showing. Uh, well, that sounds there. like the icon on site builder. Probably, yeah, it was sort of this, just this, this big hose. Uh-huh. Five, maybe four or five inch hose, uh, cylinder four or five inches in in uh, diameter, uh -huh. laying it laying it down on top of each other. Yeah, when I lived in England, I was raising three kids in eight hundred square feet, and uh, it, it's no problem. <laughs> uh huh. Mm. It seems that this is more feasible in on the West Coast where housing is so expensive. Uh, do you think long term it could depress the price of a home in California, Richard? Uh, it, part the housing cost in California, a lot of that is land. So the $850,000 uh, house with a casita, if you're building it on cheaper land, would be a lot cheaper. They say uh, both of these builders report that their actual construction costs are way less than the comparables. And one of them, Icon, is using their system to build house, houses for uh, poor people in Mexico. 
And if you're going to do that, you're going to use an inexpensive technique. You don't want to be building them Cadillac houses. So I think it'll be cheaper. Yeah, the one thing, though, about concrete is it has quite a big uh, carbon footprint compared to wood construction. Right. And uh, they should be going away from the one guy was using plastic uh, and foam insulation and the other guy's using concrete. They should both be trying to use wood or uh, materials that sequester carbon rather than uh, release carbon into the atmosphere. Well, there. This is still a brand new industry, and uh, while it turns out now they can 3D print something with uh, this made from wood, that development was just in the last few months, so it may be a little early for that. You're certainly right about the carbon footprint of concrete, and in the long term, because of that, it's not a good solution. Why is concrete bad as a carbon uh, footprint? Because carbon? to make concrete, you have to heat it to more than a thousand degrees. And that turns out to use a lot of energy. And the way that they heat it now is with fossil fuel. So Richard, if we want to move on to materials, what's this about a non-graphene story? this new type of thing that's comically thin and we don't know what it's going to do. What's that? Well, uh, you guys know I love graphene and I thought this would amuse you because uh, it's kind of like graphene, but it's not graphene. Here, let me go show you. Uh, this is an image of graphene, and you have these nice little hexagons, kind of look like a chicken wire fence, and everything has this neat arrangement. And if you look closely, you would notice that each carbon atom connects to three other carbon atoms. And uh, mathematicians and chemists say there are other arrangements of atoms that you could use this with carbon and so there are other possibilities and uh, some guys from the University of Marburg in Germany then figured out another way and they make they have actually made this and this is also carbon two-dimensional carbon, they call this biphenylene. And you notice instead of all being hexagons, you have octagons, squares, and hexagons. So you have a very different arrangement of atoms. It's still a regular arrangement of atoms and electrons, though. <coughs> and so this is a different 2D material, and they don't know yet all the things that it will do, but already they know it has uh, electronic properties that are very different from graphene. Graphene, though it will conduct electricity, is still a semiconductor, so uh, its conduction depends on electricity and other things. In the case of biphenylene, uh, it already behaves as a metal. So it is, behaves as a conductor. And one of the things they have done with it already is making strips of uh, this version of 2D materials that are very good conductors. And they think the stripes could be used as conducting wire in a future electronic devices. They also think that this material will make a superior anode for lithium ion batteries and uh, end up with uh, increasing the lithium storage capacity compared to the existing technology. So this kind of uh, 
technology that is very good at conducting electricity then could maybe make a better anode that makes a better lithium battery and uh, again they've just they've just made this recently they haven't made enough of it to test it thoroughly like they have with graphene and who knows what they're going to find next uh, so the two-dimensional material story keeps getting uh, more chapters any thoughts well richard once again on it. Okay. So, can we move on from uh, materials and non graphene to Mars? Do yes. we need to dig under to live there? And could robots, indeed swarms of robots, be what we need? Now, it underground habitats have uh, become a focal point of off planet colonization thinking uh, because they protect from uh, small meteorites and also protect from radiation and uh, so building underground makes a lot of sense as compared to surface drilling and so the question is if you're gonna build underground how in the heck do you do it? You also want to do it in a way where Mars is a long way away. And so you want to make it from materials that you can find on Mars because we don't want to ship material to them. So they have a, what I think is a cute idea. And here, let me just show you. Uh, they would use uh, swarms of these uh, little 3D or digging robots that are pictured here. And the robots would dig in the ground and dig up regolith, the kind of dirt that's there. And then uh, they would use 3D printers on Mars to uh, build the structures and then uh, to do it they have they have figured the best way to do it is not with just an individual robot but with swarms of robots that are using the kind of swarm group intelligence that is available there and they become they'll be very efficient and they will dig them in the kind of this spiral pattern so they're able to have a small footprint on the surface and good area underground and uh, so this will protect people from the weather the temperature and uh, the radiation and give them a nice cozy place to live on Mars. All you need is your swarm of robots. They have to ship the robots there, but the other material will be on Mars. They debated what to use to mix the regolith with and uh, what they actually are planning to do now is to use concrete that they uh, can make from material on Mars. And that means that before we start making the dugout uh, buildings on Mars, we have to get the Martian concrete production up and in place. So it's not a simple solution, but uh, maybe we will live in dugouts on Mars. And the moon. We could do it on the moon, too. Any thoughts? Yeah. Any thoughts? Not happening. <laughs> it's not happening. Okay. We will never live on Mars. Okay. We'll see. <laughs> Does anybody agree with me, or do you really think we're going to be living yeah. on Mars? I think we'll live well, on Mars. I'd like to ask the people who spent... Yeah. I'd like to ask the people who uh, have spent a winter in Antarctica or worked on a nuclear submarine how 
what's it like living in such a confined space? <laughs> but at least if you live on Mars, you can go outside. You don't have to stay in your shelter. I think climate change is going to beat beat our trip to Mars. I think climate change is, and and its attendant problems will doom the human race before we ever colonize Mars. But maybe I'm just being an old grouch. You're missing. Yeah. <laughs> Pardon? And the the Mars atmosphere is 95 percent CO2. So why isn't it warmer there? Why don't they have a global? They warming don't have problem? enough of it. Oh. 95 oh there's not enough atmosphere there's not enough atmosphere um richard i was wondering you said the swarms of robots would need to be transported there any possibility of using 3d printing a 3d printing to make them i hadn't thought of that that's the right idea the problem still is what do you make them out of maybe you could uh, melt your spaceship and use it to make your 3d printed uh construction robots mm -hmm. yeah the, the trouble is if you uh, also give these robots artificial intelligence perhaps they're going to get smart enough to get unionized okay <laughs> not if amazon makes the robots <laughs> <laughs> well, as Cliff seems to think, before we get there, we may have got huge problems here, and apparently we're going to breach the 1.5 centigrade degree rise within five years. What's that about? Well, that is uh, trouble on the horizon. And uh, the 1.5 Celsius mark is the mark that was set in the Paris Agreements. And that was kind of the Paris Agreements said two degree C rise is terrible. And we want to do everything we can to limit it somewhere under two degrees. And if we can limit it to 1.5, then that's a great target. And uh, now the World Meteorological Organization is saying that uh, there's a 40% chance that the world's average global temperature will be uh, 1.5 C above the pre-industrial temperatures within the next five years, a 40% chance. Now, uh, going above the temperature in one year does not mean that we have passed the 1.5 degree C thing, but what it means is we are on the way to passing it. Uh, these same people forecast that there's a 90% chance of at least one year in the next five year being the hottest on record. So, these increasing temperatures mean more melting ice, higher sea levels, more heat waves, more extreme weather, greater impacts on food security, health, and the environment. And uh, this is uh, very bad news. Mm -hmm. Any thoughts? Now, what the news means, uh, to put it in perspective, it really is just another thing that says we need to hit the brakes on emissions now and stop global warming altogether by about 2050 or uh, there's trouble. But uh, what this could mean is through... Uh having a few of these little experiments with higher temperatures, we may find that uh, the impacts aren't nearly as serious as you might have imagined, and we'd learn to adapt and deal with it rather than try to change it. Or maybe we'll find it's worse than we thought. That, that's true too. It could alert us to the significant right. seriousness of it. But well, no matter right. what, it's it, going to lead to 
tens or if not hundreds of millions of climate refugees. So there's there's no way to spin this that it, we're going to be able to deal with this in any the economic implications of of climate refugees combined with political nationalist risings and the rise of illiberal democracy. It's a, it's a vicious feedback loop. There's, it's impossible for me to imagine uh, any anything other than really reversing it. I, I just, it's all these different things are connected. It's, 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 it's a, pardon me, it's a fucking nightmare in my opinion. Mm -hmm. Well, certainly we're working on it being a nightmare, yeah. but we're trying to work yeah. to solve it. There's still, we can yeah. limit it maybe, but it's still maybe. I wonder if there's any trade-off, like the Sahara deserts and all deserts get bigger and bigger, but does a place like Northern Canada become more comfortable to live in? <laughs> we're hoping so. <laughs> <laughs> Well, what they know is that there will be more rain and that the rain patterns will change and uh, maybe the more rain will bring more crops and lush forests. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I haven't seen anybody forecasting that, however, but we can fantasize it on hot science. Yeah, we heard it here. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, there, are, there, are, there, are, there are little positives like uh, Johannes and I are enjoying a much more pleasant Cincinnati during the winter time. Of course, uh, Johannes will be in <laughs> Chapala, Lake Chapala. But yeah, I mean, you can talk about little things like it may be nice in Canada. And I can tell you Cincinnati winters are much more pleasant. But these are like drops in the ocean compared with uh, huge cities on the ocean right now. They're going to become uninhabitable and the, the other um, other things that I've already mentioned. Bangladesh so, yeah, is a good example. Pardon me, say again? Bangladesh is a good example. That's not a huge city. It's a country that's basically at sea level. Right, exactly. Mm -hmm. So there are little blips of positive, but, but the negative, they're, they're like drops in the ocean compared to the, the so you won't uh you won't uh give up all the people in bangladesh for having more pleasant winters in cincinnati <laughs> no comment you must be a liberal <laughs> i i think i'm just smart but if you want to call me a liberal go ahead okay so we gotta get you down to chapala Wonderful climate down there. <laughs> now stay in Cincinnati. <laughs> Richard, the next story in biology. Now, Cliff might say that if it takes years of development and testing, it's irrelevant because of all the other things that are likely to happen first. But anyway, what's this? <laughs> into power Don't put words in my mouth. <laughs> <laughs> What are peptides and what's this powerful drugs they can become? Now, uh, this is another uh, biology story, or I guess synthetic, synthetic biology story, though they don't call it that way. I call it synthetic biology because uh, the bioengineer, did you hear about bioengineers when you were going to school? Anyway, the bioengineer, bio is using uh, biomimetics, which is imitating a class of uh, other biochemicals. And it turns out among the most powerful of the biochemicals in the human immune system are the peptides. Uh, we don't hear much about the peptides, but they kill all sorts of tiny critters, including viruses, bacteria, and fungi. Uh, and the problem, the reason we don't hear about peptides as a cure or treatment for different diseases is they have a fundamental problem which is that uh, the enzymes that do things like break down protein so you can consume food, break these peptides down very quickly. 
so they're powerful, but in the human body, they have a short life. And so now, uh, at a, a woman associate professor of bioengineering at uh, Stanford, has created peptide-like molecules that she calls peptoids. And it looks like these uh, can circumvent peptide shortcomings and can become new molecules that will be the basis for an emerging class of antiviral drugs. Uh, Again, there are years of testing and development that have to be done, but uh, these, uh, the peptides uh, deteriorate quickly because the bonds that hold them together are weak, and so they're uh, attacked by the proteases, which are just proteins. Uh, the peptoids, though, she's re-engineered these bonds for, to make them much stronger. And so, now that she has done this, uh, they, uh, they're they looking as a first sample uh, herpes virus, which is uh, widespread and uh, there's nothing you can do about it. They reviewed... Uh, a uh, number of potential peptides, narrowed it down to 10 candidates, synthesized those 10 candidates, and then within those, they found one that showed complete effectiveness against the virus, and uh, that's the one that they will be treating herpes with. And... Uh, these peptoids work by disrupting the virus, the viruses encapsulating outer membrane and the virus, uh, they bust the bubble and the virus falls apart. And uh, because these peptoids attack the membrane, not the virus, it looks like they have potential to work on many other kind of viruses as well, because the viruses all share this outer laying, layer. And so they have synthesized uh, this one very good peptoid and sent samples around the world to different places that are working uh, uh, as in infectious disease labs to test these new structures against other viruses like COVID-19 and the influenza virus and the cold virus. And they say the early reports are very encouraging. And uh, the researcher who is behind this says she is absolutely delighted to see these world results coming in from all around the world. So maybe we have a whole new way to treat viruses that uh, will be the best antiviral element yet. And what it does is imitate what the body already does and the bioengineers figured out a way to improve on what we do already. Any thoughts? Well, the one issue is she's making something that isn't uh, destroyed by enzymes or biological means, and it there could be all manner of unintended consequences. That's right. Like, Maybe it'll uh, take over the world. Or it could be like plastic and uh, not degrade, and uh, we could be overrun with it. So. Yeah. Well, I wonder uh, about that part. One of the things in the uh, human system is there, you know, we talk about the microbiome, and when we talk about it, mainly we're talking about the bacteria, but the other elements of the microbiomes are, in fact, viruses that mainly are the ones that attack bacteria and then fungi. And if uh, this thing kills all the viruses, might it kill the good viruses too? 
Yeah. <laughs> Unintended well, consequences. Well, Richard, is there something that we could intend? Is it time for a world without gender? Where we treat people <laughs> based on who they are rather than on the form of their genitals. What about that? Uh, this idea of gender is undergoing a revolution at the moment. And uh, unconventional gender types are behaving, gaining a lot more acceptance. If you watch things like Netflix, one of the things that you will see regularly now is other gendered characters of one form or another. And so while the idea of gender is undergoing a revolution, at the same time, virtually every move that is made in society to move away from the gender binary approach, such as even permitting gender neutral designations on various forms and documents triggers a backlash. And these controversies uh, are all uh, around an ancient question, which is how fundamental are mm -hmm. sex categories? Do humans naturally belong in one of two groups, females and males, that are distinct not only in form of their genitals, but also to their brains and behavior? Now, in this discussion, you have to kind of leave out the other 1% of humans that are born with intersex genitals, because they're a whole nother case altogether. But if we just uh, go back and look at men and women, studies comparing men and women f often find differences. Some of them are small, like women have better reading comprehension as a group. And some are big, like most women prefer a man as a partner. And you can argue as to whether these differences stem directly from an individual sex or from the different ways in which society treats individuals with male and female uh, genitals. But this nature versus nurture debate is irrelevant, irrelevant to the question, do men and women belong to two different classes? Uh, if they do, then the woman's characteristics and a man's characteristics should be things that are consistent across the group. But if you look at diff differences in brain and behavior between men and women, this doesn't add up. There are very few individuals that have only male behavior or only female behavior. Most people are a mixture of both. And uh, humans do not belong into two different sets in terms of brains and behaviors. The social categories are real and exert a profound influence on the way in which we behave and perceive ourselves. Uh, the gender binary assigns different roles and status and powers to humans with male and female genitals and different expectations from them in terms of their behavior. Uh, but if the uh, difference was truly biological, you wouldn't need all these social, social rules to keep people conforming to their biological identity. And so is it time to get rid of the gender binary society and start to treat people according to their own actual mosaic of characteristics rather than the form of their genitals? Is it time for a world with no gender? 
Any I thoughts? Leave it, I leave it up to you. Uh, we get to decide today for the world. I think because women carry the baby, that's a built-in bias that is always going to make some difference anyway. What when the uh, biologists work a way for an artificial womb to be in a man, is that going to make that difference? If you can carry the baby, Johannes, is that going to make a difference? I won't be alive. <laughs> uh, how about your grandson having your great granddaughter? Yeah, let's face the fact, though, that carrying a baby for yeah. only nine months, and we're really talking about the rest of Okay. But I think already there is a movement away from an all male dominated society. When you look at the news every night, I'm amazed to see how many of the people being interviewed, or for that matter, the interviewers are female. I mean, it is, it is distinctly more than it was, oh, maybe 30, 40 years ago. You know, when all the males were supposed to make all the decisions. And, and so I, I think there is a distinct movement towards getting a, getting away from thinking that males are the ones that have to make the decisions. Anyhow, my, my thing. Now, when, for me, I had to go through this raising children. And, you know, uh, whether you mean to or not, uh, as soon as you get uh, the pink outfit for your daughter and the blue outfit for your son, already you're uh, working on uh, putting in these kind of sexual standards. And the problem raising children that we found is, you know, sometime that girls want to play with trucks and boys want to play with dolls. And when you see that happen, there are a lot of families in which the parents would squelch that. So you can see how these gender roles, the binary gender roles, uh, affect our child rearing. And with that being the case, how can we have a chance for a non-binary society when we have binary child rearing? You know, I'm really con concerned about the increase. Uh, first of all, I was astonished that only 1%, or that as much as 1% of the human population has intersexual uh, genital uh, yes. parts. Okay. I mean, to me, that's a big percentage, much more than I thought it was. And it seems to me we're hearing more about that these days. And one of the things we're hearing more about is transgender operations um, for young children. And I think that, the, you know, this, can be a, I think this is something that should go, give us some pause to think because we are forcing apparently children at a very young age to choose between one or another. And anything that can be done to make it clear to those children that they do not have to choose to be the other one that they don't feel that, or that they feel that they are, but they don't have on their body, the better. Yes. Because I, I think it's ridiculous that they should have to go through medical procedures, you know, that, that mm -hmm. have a lasting effect on their health probably in order to mm -hmm. conform to some ideal in their mind that society mm -hmm. is influencing them about. Right, and that's the binary, that's the binary view of sex uh, that you're talking about there very directly. So they have to go through an operation to make themselves appropriately binary. Yeah. You know. I, I, with that in mind, I think they should keep people's options open as long as possible. <laughs> I think we're not talking biology here. We're talking about culture. And right. I think yes. my grandchildren have a very different view of what's permissible than I did. Um, my grandchildren were hysterical that somebody was dating a man who thought that there were pink jobs and blue jobs. 
Now, I don't know that my son, how my son feels about that, but his children have a marked feeling that that's ridiculous. <laughs> Yay, think, children. Yes, <laughs> absolutely in this area. And I think that may be part of the background why some this article was not from some hippy dippy place. This was from Scientific American. So uh, that's fairly mainstream. And for the argument to get that mainstream, there has to be this culture change already to move the Overton window to where you can have this discussion. But I know that this it, this was from Scientific American, but it was an opinion piece. It was a right. blog. And right. at the end of the article, it said, these views are not necessarily the view right. of yes. American. Mm -hmm. The other but, thing I noticed is that it's two years old. And I think it's interesting that, you know, we're, we're talking about it today because usually your, your notices are less than two weeks old. Now here's something that's two years old. And I went looking to find commentary about this article, and I couldn't find any. Interesting. I found a couple of very, uh, I kept on one thing that was post 2019. And that was basically talking about from, a, from the feminist perspective, you know. So it's very interesting. I think, you know, again, uh, I have a variety of sources for the stuff that I get. And, you know, some of them are uh, things that pull in, many of them are things that pull in information from different places. And this one didn't float up in any of my sources. I've been going through this stuff every week now for about three years. So I was reading the science news at the time this came out and I didn't see it in any of my sources. Until this week, yeah. Yeah, until this week. Well, I'm glad it came up. It's appropriate for the month, too. Yeah, me too. Me too. <laughs> well, Richard, if we maybe could move on to our last story. Um, and I don't know, what's this about there being a difference between numerical and biological age? How does that affect health? And what was this research that enabled us to find out about that? Now, uh, it turns out you might be older or younger than you think. And so this was a new study that was looking at uh, people's chronological age and then comparing that against an artificial intelligence AI enabled EKG that can provide uh, its own evaluation of uh, your physical age rather than your chronological age. And uh, within the people that they studied, they uh, the AI predicted the age fairly well of most subjects uh, being within less than a year gap between uh, their age and the actual age. But they found out a number of subjects had a gap that was much larger, you know, either being older than the chronological age or younger than the chronological age. And they continued to study these and what they found out that the likelihood to die during the follow-up or before the follow-up was a lot higher among those who, uh, according to the AI, were older than their chronological age. And the association was even stronger when uh, you looked at death through heart disease. Now, the basis for this was the AI evaluating the age based on an EKG. So maybe it's better for heart disease than death by all causes. And the EKG 
may uh, be a way to detect accelerated aging. And if you can detect accelerated aging, then maybe there's something they can do about it. First, we have to detect it. And this is fairly significant. When the researchers adjusted the data to, for standard risk factors, the association between uh, age gap and cardiovascular morality, mortality was even more pronounced. So whatever they're finding there, uh, there is a clear association that showed people with an older body age than chronological age were much more likely to die. So that indicates that that's not a bad way of looking at things and it could be useful. The problem for us is that now that we have this concept that is proven that uh, EKG age relates to survival, when can things like this get incorporated into uh, clinical pro uh, practice? And I guess the way it would work is first it would be in places like America or maybe Denmark where they're more advanced. And then finally it would get to Mexico where it could do some of us some good. <laughs> Any thoughts? Well, I, I, I think that the, uh, bio, that the biological age and the, uh, the age that you attain is uh, pretty much a, uh, a function of the diet that you follow. If you're, if you're not wealthy, for instance, you might be eating stuff that actually will make you age more so than if uh, you're, uh, you're, you're um, using, you know, products that have proven to, to, to not make you fat or something like that, that uh, you know, uh, you eat all your veggies and, and whatever, and uh, but a lot of people don't have uh, no concept of that, and uh, they eat steak every day, for instance, uh, uh, whatever, you know, but uh, I think that diet determines very much whether you uh, live long or not. No. And, uh, uh, one of the things that it could be with a tool like this, uh, then you have a way maybe where the scientists can start to uh, do some uh, more study. And if you, for example, uh, got uh, a reasonable population of people who were several years older than their chronological age, and see people several years younger, then you can start to look at diet and behavior and other things and start to see uh, with some uh, scientific basis what the factors might be. So it could be as a research tool, this uh, is very useful and can give us information faster than waiting for a thousand people to die. Mm -hmm. When I talk to people who either are nurses or have been nurses, they always tell me that when they have a group of patients, the ones who have the most will to live, the most determined attitude to get over their illnesses are the people who survive. And probably that is just as important factor as... Um, you know, as anything else. Uh -huh. So there are multiple factors that could be in play. That's why I want to use this as a research tool to maybe figure out what those factors are. You know, I yeah. think we all know that uh, it's diet and behavior and psychological stuff. We just yeah. don't know yeah. what the mix yeah. is. Well, surroundings is also part of it. I mean, if you live in an area that is uh, constantly very much polluted and you keep breeding that, you know, things of that sort, that, that right. definitely shortens the lifespan of... Uh, right. Of uh, Richard, there is something I recently heard about. It's called the Interventions 
testing protocol, ITP. And three different universities are simultaneously doing this research. Um, what they're doing is they can give you something uh, that uh, scientists have said, well, this is something we want to check out. Uh, it might be metformin or something else. But these three different universities look at what is the effect of this thing, let's say it's metformin, mm -hmm. on, 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 uh, on mice. Um, and they, uh, mice, because they live less uh, long, uh, shorter than we do. Right. Uh, uh, and, and from that, they're developing a list of things that make a big difference or not at all. And a lot of the things, it seems, that we think makes it make a difference don't in fact make any difference to how long we live or how well we do it. But uh, I think we'll be hearing more about this interventions testing over the next while because there are an awful lot of things we can try, but which ones really work? Right. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, it's certainly true that the data is not very good about that yet. It'd be nice if insurance gift companies give you a discount for being younger than your chronological uh, age. <laughs> oh, that's right. Could we get a discount on our insurance and hospital bills? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, I think Richard, it occasionally is, go ahead. Okay. Uh, I think education is also a factor because if we are educated, I think we believe in science and we get the vaccine and those that are less educated. That's because right. Say, well, I but think that, I say that another thing we should try is having daily naps. That's right. <laughs> and again, we just need data, I think. <laughs> well, Richard, thanks a lot for today's session. Thanks to everybody else for participating. And once again, we'll see you next week. Thanks. All right. Bye -bye. Adios. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you both. Bye, right, John. Goodbye. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Adios.